Kimberly Magic Academy. By the time they graduate, 20% of students who enroll here have been consumed by the spell. A tree here called Madam was supposed to not bloom, but today the flowers are in full bloom. She often scares new students on the first day of school, but it seems Oliver Horn is unafraid of her words. After all, this is no ordinary school he's entering. A girl named Katie is very afraid of Madam's threats. A red-haired guy named Greenwood laughs and tells her not to worry about what the pride plants say. He explains that Magiflora, like them, absorbs magic particles from the ground, which affects their personalities. They say a lot of the ones around here are particularly nasty. She was more secure knowing this. She doesn't know a lot about plants. She does love magical fauna, though. He asks her what creatures she likes. She says she likes all of them. The little ones, the big ones, the slimy ones. A blonde girl asks a guy named Pete to stop because he almost stepped on Madam's stem. She thought he was being rude but he was just too absorbed in the book. Madam is teasing a girl named Nanao. People wondered if she is a samurai. Oliver doesn't know why he himself notices that girl. He thinks it might be her outfit, or perhaps he felt something in his heart. Something like a premonition, or what people sometimes call fate. People marveled when witnessing a parade of magical fauna. That's Kimberly for them. First Flora, then Fauna. Greenwood never saw a dragon like that. Oliver says that's a Fafnir. Nothing else has scales that bright. However, Katie doesn't like this because they're making a troll walk in the parade, like the other magical beasts. Greenwood thinks it's a troll. They don't speak our language, and the wild ones attack people. So, of course, we train them to serve our needs. Katie says that's because humans invade their territory. They're actually kind creatures. But in Greenwood's hometown, they mess up our fields every year. Or is it okay when they invade us? Katie says, the land for those fields used to be theirs, too. Pete asks them to stop arguing because they are disturbing his reading. Oliver understands how the two feel, but why don't we talk about this later? A mysterious girl casts magic on Katie's legs, causing her to rush towards the beasts. Michella panics because the troll's heading straight for her. They won't make it in time to save her. Aurora makes the troll step back. She draws her sword and is going to fight it. That's suicidal. Michella attacks to attract its attention, but it didn't even glance this way. Greenwood suggests we'll all do it at once. Oliver says, we are not strong enough to just fling spells at it but can use the wind spell and bring together a strong wind. When he gives the signal, target it at that point. Oliver doesn't have time to explain and tells them just do what he says and don't ask questions. They guess they don't have a choice. The three start casting wind spells. Oliver tells them not to stop the spell no matter what happens. He casts the tibia spell, Dragon Voice. It's just a loud noise that he changed to sound like a dragon's roar. But even a fake dragon's still a dragon. If the troll senses a predator, it will lose focus. Oliver tells the two girls to run away, but Nano attacks and easily defeats the troll. But soon she felt her hands go numb because the troll's skin was too hard. She thanks everyone for their help. Thanks to that, she was able to launch a perfect attack. That roar was so intense. She almost wet herself before the entrance ceremony. Oliver asks her, You didn't have a plan in mind when you stood in front of that troll. She laughs and says no. The katana she's got with her doesn't even have a cutting edge. Oliver thinks that was so reckless. If their spell had failed, she'd have died. Oliver doesn't quite understand this girl. But the color of her hair back there, innocent color, named for the crystal-like hair through which magic particles easily flow, it also signifies powerful mana circulation within the body itself, which means she possesses great potential as a mage. A teacher appears and asks everyone to keep quiet. The headmistress is about to take the podium. She is their headmistress, Esmeralda. First, she apologizes for the incident during the parade. The troll that went out of control has already been recaptured, and the injured students have been treated. Just looking at her makes Nano break out in a cold sweat. She must be incredibly strong. Esmeralda says, This place, Kimberly Magic Academy, is a house of learning where students will spend the next seven years. We prioritize two things here, freedom and results. To put it as simply as she can, your life and death are in your own hands. That was no mere metaphor. Only 80% of students make it out of Kimberly intact. The other 20% are permanently crippled when their magic goes out of control goes missing when something they summon drags them back with it or dies after going mad and attempting to slay their fellow students. In the world of magic, we say that these individuals are consumed by the spell. But that is what it means to learn magic. That's how we've made it to where we are today, by paving our road with the corpses of the dead. She says it again. Your life and death are in your own hands, but leave something behind when you die. When a tiger dies, it leaves behind its pelt. You must become tigers, or there will be nothing left of you here. That is all she has to say. 
If anyone has questions, she'll take them now. Nana suddenly raises her hand and says, When your head hurts, you can cure it by rubbing in a circular motion right here. Esmeralda asks her if that was a question. Nana says that it was just advice because she saw Esmeralda seem in pain. Esmeralda continues the ceremony. Next is the welcome banquet. You are now free to talk among yourselves. Eat and drink as you like, and join your new classmates in conversation. She uses magic to bring everyone to their seats. The upperclassmen welcome new students to Kimberly and tell them to forget about the principal's speeches. She was just intimidating them so they could study better. The group begins to gather and introduce each other. This blonde girl named Michella, the eldest daughter of the McFarlane family, a dignified and proud clan that's lived in southern Yelglin since ancient times. This hairstyle is a symbol of her family. Next is Katie, an exchange student from Farnland, a union country in the north. She likes magical fauna, actually all kinds of animals. She thanks them for saving her. Greenwood asks her why she started running like that. Katie assumes it was someone's prank on her. Michella says we can talk about that later. For now, let's have fun. Next is Greenwood. He's from a family of magical farmers with a fairly long history. He is pretty confident in his knowledge of plants. And if they ever want some yummy veggies, just ask him. Next is Pete. Both his parents are non-magical. His family has no history. That's all. So he enrolled as an ordinary student. It's tough to get one of those slots. Oliver appreciates the book Pete is reading. That's Alfred Werner's introduction to magic for non-magicals. Pete is excited because Oliver is also knowledgeable about books. Next is Oliver. His family's been magical since his grandfather's day. But right now, he is living with relatives. He has a brother and sister, actually, who are older students at Kimberly. They've told him a lot about this place. Michella says that Dragon Voice surprised her. She has never seen someone use a flute spell like that. Oliver is pretty good at customizing spells and coming up with new ways to use them. He is glad it helped out. The last is Nano. She was born to a samurai family in Turakuisen, Yamatsukuni. It was a strange twist of fate that brought her here, actually. She was about to be killed in a war when a passing mage saved her. This McFarlane, as he called himself, invited her here. Michella asks her, did you just say McFarlane? That was probably her dad. He's a part-time lecturer here at Kimberly. He didn't know he went all the way to Asia to find new students, though. The mutual introductions are over, it is time for them to focus on enjoying the party. Everyone is surprised when they see Nano's plate of food. That roast beef is supposed to serve six people. Oliver is sure that she doesn't understand how meals are eaten here. He tells her to just sit tight, and he'll make her a plate. Michella will teach her all she'd ever want to know about table manners. One plate of food after another. Nano feels like a princess. That looks fun. Katie also wants Oliver to get something for her. People start teasing him and seeing him as a waiter. Oliver brings Pete a plate of vegetables because his plates all meet. Nano feels the food is delicious and asks for another plate. The next morning, Oliver wakes up very early. His roommate is Pete, who is still sleeping. Oliver takes a little walk around the dormitory. He sees that the mana particles are thick here. A mysterious girl greets him. She introduces herself as Teresa, a covert operative sent by his brother, Gwyn. She was asked to watch over him until he settled in. His brother is worried for his safety, so she will be following him everywhere for a while. Oliver wants to see her face, but she tells him to choose another time. He can call her any time he needs her. Then she leaves. Oliver hears Nano's voice nearby. He passes by and sees her bathing at a fountain, and he immediately uses magic to cover the place. Oliver tells her that she can't bathe here, but she doesn't mind if people see her. She explained that she is not bathing, she is purifying herself. It only felt right to purify the blood she bathed in during the last war. When Oliver asks about the scars on her body, she says that they are from war. She is sorry if they're not pleasant to look at. He turns around and sees a familiar sight, a blonde girl who had told him those things. Nana Hibia, a strange, innocent girl he met at Kimberly Magic Academy. But he smelled on her the faint scent of blood, which nothing could wipe away. 